Hey everybody, it's Jenny from Growth Mode Marketing. You're listening to Demand Gen Fix, the podcast where our team of growth motors and our guests discuss the ins and outs of demand generation and why we believe it's the key to long-term sustainable growth, especially in the HR tech industry. Hey everybody, it's Jenny with Growth Mode Marketing and the Demand Gen Fix. And today I'm here with Erica and with Deanna, also from Growth Mode. Our topic today is about your digital footprint. Um, And what is your digital footprint? It is your online presence, right? And today we're going to talk about why we think that that digital footprint and online presence needs to be your best salesperson. So we're going to get into the ins and outs and um, some details on why, how, and all of that good stuff. So um, maybe, Deanna, you could start out talking about why we think that the digital footprint needs to be your best salesperson. Yeah, you know, we really believe that if your organization's digital footprint isn't large and of high quality, that you need to change that. And, you know, the reason is it's really about catering to how people want to buy. I think historically, enterprise software companies and and B2B in general, we come up with these sales processes and we try to pull people through those processes, but it's bringing them into our process instead of building trust with them so that they bring us into their buying process. And I think it's really important that we're catering to what they want to do and how they want to buy because I think in general... People don't like talking to sales reps. And I I don't mean that as any disrespect to all my friends out there who are sales reps. Your job is really important, but you know how hard it is to pick up the phone and call someone if they're not ready to talk to you. Uh, You've got quotas to meet. You've got pressures to carry the organization forward with success. And you might be spinning your wheels because you're trying to pull people into this process when they're just not there. And statistics show that actually 80% of the B2B sales interactions between buyers and sellers will actually be done online. So through digital channels, meaning that buyer is 80% of that interaction overall is actually being done with that buyer doing research on their own um, before they actually get to that sales rep and before that sales rep should really be focusing their time and resources and attention on that on that prospect or that buyer. So to us, really what this means is that the buying process is 80% complete before the B2B prospect is actually willing to talk to your sales rep. And I think a lot of us can relate even on the B2C side as a consumer. Um, it might even be more than that. We want to do our own research online before we ever make that decision or want to have a conversation what does this mean? Your sales team has that 20% chance to actually influence the buyer in this process. Why not have your salespeople and those resources wait until that buyer is ready to bring you into their process and have that conversation and start to talk solutions and um, resources or products and services rather than having them chasing around all of these cold leads? Yeah, and uh, I yeah. feel... Like Deanna said, it's not about the salespeople, right? They're doing their jobs. They're doing a great job. It's the fact that everything has changed, right? I mean, it used to be that the salesperson was your biggest asset. They were out there. They were making the calls. They were getting in touch with people. They were doing all that stuff. But people aren't interested in that anymore. You know, it's an online world. It's a digital world. Everybody's made the move. I mean, it's just the way of the world now and is exasperated with COVID, but it was already happening. People want to do their own research. They want to, you know, see what options are out there before they, you know, even start to narrow down companies that they're looking at. So because so many other companies have all of that information out there, if you don't, people are going to just skip right past you and go somewhere where they can find what they're looking for. Yeah, right. that's so true. And it, it, when you say everybody's doing it, I, I would throw the caveat in every buyer's doing that. I think a lot of companies are not there, though. You know, I anytime I talk to a prospect, the first thing that I do is Google to see what their digital footprint looks like. And there's a lot of companies out there that don't have a wide reaching footprint. And so if 
I'm a consumer, you know, I'm a buyer, I'm going to go buy your HR technology or your recruitment management platform. I want to find the information. I want a rich experience on your website. I want to be able to see a video demo. I want to see case studies. Like I want to go deep and find that information, but I also want to go beyond your website and look at third-party sites. So for example, do you have a lot of reviews built up, which are pretty important in the software space? If someone goes to G2, for example, or Trustpilot, Mm -hmm. are they finding your company on there? Are they finding a lot of reviews? Are those reviews positive? Little known secret, you can actually control some of that. There's some pay to play with some of these platforms. There's ways to recruit people to do it. But that's all part of the bigger strategy of building out your digital footprint is, number one, have a really good website that goes deep and allows a person to do self-research. But number two, Two and number three, like, what about your owned channels beyond your website? So your social media presence, your blogs, podcasts, you know, any kind of content that you can control when and how it gets put out there. And then, you know, I would say that number three is your third party content. How do you get in bed, per se, with industry influencers and experts and media outlets that are targeting the audience that you want to get tap into. Yeah. When you brought up the website, um, having a good website, I agree. I think that is number one. Um, I feel like, you know, even as consumers, if, if you're out there and you're going to be looking for something and you come across somebody who has just a horrible website, I mean, what's the first thing you think? You think this is crap. I don't, I'm not going to buy this. You. Mm-hmm. So of course, you know, I mean, that's like number one, because <laughs> you Google them and you see that and you're like, well, they don't know what they're doing. They, they're so out of date. And then, yeah, if you can't find anything else out there, it just, I think it, it diminishes the credibility of the organization. As we said before, nowadays, you know, so many companies have their information out there and their content out there that you can just skip right past it and go find somebody who does have the information that you need. And the other thing about that, too, is that, like I was saying, if I'm out there looking for something, it's not always like during the nine to five workday either. And so that that's something to think about, too, why you need to be online and have good digital presence, because you need to be available 24 seven. People aren't just doing this research, you know, during the business week or during the weekday, you know, they're looking all the all the time. And so you want to be able to sell to them any time of the day, right? I mean, any time, any day that they're out there to to find it, you want to be available. Jenny, to your point about the pandemic kind of accelerating some of this, the companies that excelled at, during the pandemic and were able to kind of keep on their feet with as far as marketing goes, a lot of those companies really were focused on some of this digital footprint and the content strategy and stuff like that up front. So if you already had this strong digital presence going into something like a pandemic, those were the people who were excelling at a lot of other companies were struggling because you're backpedaling and trying to fill the gaps and start to show up digitally and try to get in front of people where you think they're at. And you didn't, a lot of these companies didn't have that background or they were trying to just sort of spitball and run ads and do things and they didn't have the right content or pieces available for someone to actually go and do all of this research on their own. And, you know, you might have some good top of funnel pieces to get somebody to your website, but then what are you offering them? Do they have the ability to go do some of that research and can they get the information they need or did they just see an infographic you posted on social and then they get to your website and they have no clue how your solution can help them? You're going to lose that that person. And that's really where we saw people struggling is when they haven't taken into account the importance of a a strong presence overall. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I think you have to think about your content at every stage of the funnel, because, you know, to your point, Erica, if I go and I see this infographic, and it's really interesting, and I'm like, I'm going to go check this company out, it can't go straight to see a live demo. 
I'm not there. I'm just interested in learning more. And so it's like, do you put more top of funnel content in to really, you know, help them just become familiar with your brand and start to follow you and, and you know, have that brand recognition and, and hopefully over time some brand loyalty? But then what? You know, I can't just see top of the funnel either. So if everything on your website and out there is top of funnel and I want to learn about your product, Again, I don't want to talk to a sales rep. I saw a uh, statistic last week, actually, from a Gartner article that was just published that said, I want to say it was 72% of millennials in the B2B space said they do not want to talk to a sales rep at all. So the statistic earlier about their ever, ever, think about it. Okay, you're selling a $500,000 technology system, it seems like I need to talk to this person. But from their perspective, if I have the budget, and I know that Mm -hmm. I need this, I want to be able to self research. And by the time, you know, we go through all this, maybe the only reason to talk to a sales rep is to negotiate pricing. I mean, think about it. You got the budget. You're going to send it. You just want to know how they compare to each (laughs) other. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And that's the way everything's yes. going to go. I mean, we, we got yeah. we have to we have to, you know, make sure that we're meeting these people where they're at. And if that's how they want to buy things, then companies need to be there for that. They need to, you know, be up for the challenge. Change their ways. Yeah. Yeah, and and you need that content at each level of the funnel. And and when we talk about the funnel, we're saying, okay, there's the top of the funnel, which is the awareness type of content. There's the middle of the funnel, which is consideration. That's, I'm starting to look at who the vendors are out there that can solve this problem for me. And then you've got the bottom of the funnel, which is the decision. And that's like, do I pick company A or company B? And so you want to make sure because everybody's at different stages of where they're at. Most people aren't in market to buy your product right now. So you need that top of funnel content. But what about the 5% or so that actually are actively looking? If I can't find content, and let's say I'm looking at HR payroll software. Well, there's over 600 of those options. So if I'm looking at that and I go to your website and I do a Google search and I'm not seeing your content and I'm not hearing about it from my other payroll friends out there who are making purchases too, I'm going to skip over you and go to the next one because I'm really only going to evaluate two to three vendors most likely. And so, you know, the whole point of making that digital footprint your best salesperson is How do you get out there in front of them so they know you exist? And then how do you provide content that is meaningful and relevant for them if they're at the top of the funnel, but then goes deep into the product and all the pieces so that they can really understand who your software is, who your company is, and how to evaluate whether they want to buy it or not. And the the beauty is... As you start to build this out, building out a digital footprint is not a one-time, one-and-done thing. It's something you continue to add to and continue to enhance and progress and change. I mean, you should be looking at what you consider success with some of these pieces and making adjustments as you go. And I think, um, you know, the beauty is as you continue to build out this digital footprint and build out a, a platform of resources for your buyers or your prospects, we actually have the ability when you get the right technologies in place as marketers to start sort of guiding somebody's journey as well. So as you start to learn and you can start to look at the success of different types of content and look at how people are moving through the funnel and you know where you might be losing their interest and where you're getting them back on track, we can, as we start to build this out and continue to evolve, we have the ability to start to watch those things and start to actually guide the way that we want someone to kind of progress through that funnel and through the buying process so that ultimately we're handing over your actual sales reps, very high quality leads and people who are ready to talk and who are actually wanting to make contact now with your company because they've had this experience. They've 
done their research and gotten to that point. So we should talk about, you know, as you mentioned, going through the funnel, we should talk about different things that you can do at each stage of the funnel that would make sense to get out there. You know, where should you be putting your digital content, you know, for each stage? So for instance, when you're starting with the awareness stage, what kinds of things should we be suggesting people put out there and where should they be putting that content? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I I think there's an asterisk by everything that we say because the reality is you take like webinars. One could argue those are top of funnel. One could argue those are, you know, middle of the funnel. It depends what the topics are. And so, you know, I think keep that as a frame of reference when we throw stuff out there. Like some of it could be used as a tactic across different stages of the funnel, but it's really about the topics and the tactics that you're focusing on. So if you're talking top of the funnel, and I look at that as, okay, you're trying to plant seeds with people. This is where the majority of prospects are at any given time. They're not in market to buy today, but they're interested in topics that are relevant to the, you know, the services and the technologies that you offer. So they're looking up information. They're probably trying to look for things like best practice guides, top 10 tips, stuff like that. And the reason we want to get that kind of thing out there too is, you know, um, you want to build that brand awareness and that trust and that um, credibility so that, you know, when people do make their way through the funnel, your name is top of mind. You know, they know that you've already offered them this information, that you sound like you know what you're talking about, like you're an expert. And so that as they move through, they that's who they're thinking of. The, the companies that have offered them good advice, good information, good content. Right. And it's not product focused at this point. You know, the intent of this top of funnel brand awareness type of content, you're not trying to sell them. You're just focused on solving problems, sharing a unique point of view. And the intent is just, I want to build brand awareness and trust with this individual. If they trust you when they actually are in market to buy a solution, they're going to know who you are already because the reality is they're not going to buy from you if they don't know you exist or who you are. They're going to pick one of the other million options that are out there for them. So then it becomes like, okay, how do we make sure they know we exist? Then you get to the, you know, the much smaller proportion of prospects out there who are middle of the funnel. And that's the consideration stage. And that's what I would say. You're casting a net. You're throwing it out there, trying to capture the people who are hungry for more information. That's where you start to talk about company and product information. Like, how do we solve the challenges to the problems you have? What are our solutions and how does it benefit you? Right. And that gets into more of, you can start to share some client examples or, um, you know, show proof points as far as how your solution has benefited other people that are in this buyer's shoes um, and start to make those connections and sort of let them make the connection to, okay, this is, this might be a solution or this might be something I should consider. Um, You know, other people are in the same boat having these same struggles. So starting to make those connections so that you start to fall into their consideration set. And do you think this is a good time too, to then kind of compare yourself to other, other companies in your same industry? I mean, is this where you start to differentiate yourself or, you know, even compare and contrast yourself to other companies so that if they are looking at a few of the contenders, you're telling them why you're different than the others, why you're better, a better choice. Right. You're, you're totally trying to convince them at this point to evaluate your solution. Like consider us for your need. And this is why we should make actual consideration set where you're down to, I'm ready to make a decision. You want to be that two to three vendors that they actually pick for serious consideration so that you can make it to the decision stage. Because if you don't make their consideration set, you're never going to make it to the decision phase. So then what happens when you're in that two to three? 
what's next? What's the next step? How do you, how do you pull the, you know, <laughs> how do you make them uh, pull the lever? How do you say, convince right. them yes. that, yeah. The next step is really once we kind of have identified somebody has moved into this phase or we're, you know, trying to push people to the next stage of the funnel, you start to share different types of content. Like this might be when you're sharing a pricing calculator or more of those case studies or testimonials from your clients. Like people want to start to understand, have you made a difference for companies like me or for buyers like me? Um, People want to start at this point to see demos, whether that's a virtual demo, it's a in-person demo, you know, you're, you're getting them closer to that point where you could get them to pull the trigger and actually want to see um, that kind of thing with, within your product and in your solution. So that's at the point where you're really trying to, again, show why you're different than the com- competition and really differentiate yourself showing why your solution is better in these ways and also why this might be the best choice for someone like them, like that buyer. And are we still giving this kind of content away for free? I think yes. I mean, that's a, Good that's a great question. question because yeah, here is like, this is the stage where people start to put forms in front of stuff. Like I think, I think a lot of marketers and companies in general, like have no problem giving top of the funnel content away freely ungated read it all you want there's no trade secrets in that some organizations will start to really like protect their content the deeper you go into it and i think you know the common reasons that i've heard for that is well we don't want our competitors to see this or you know, this is the really good stuff. You know, if they're reading it, they're ready to buy. We need their name. The problem with that is this is the content you want them to read. This is where you're trying to show them that you are superior to the other solutions and the best choice for that buyer. And you're putting an obstacle in front of them. And some people are going to say, no, thanks. I'm not going to submit my information. Because remember, those millennials and probably everyone that comes after them have said, the vast majority of them, I do not want to talk to a sales rep. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, the only way to get this information is to, you know, give us your left kidney and we will follow up (laughs) with you five times a day for the next three weeks until you talk to us. A lot of people are going to say, I'm out of here. Remember, there's a list of 600 vendors I get to choose from and someone else is going to give me that information for free. So I think it's a really good question to say, should you gate it? My response, absolutely not. I think when it comes to gating content, you should give away content at all stages freely and save the forms and the gating for like requesting a live demo signing up for your newsletter or a straight out, I want to be contacted by a sales rep. If you're so worried about your competition, finding out what your demo looks (laughs) like, I mean, of course they're going through the process and looking at your demo, right? I mean, yeah, it's so true. It's not that hard. They're going to go through the hoops (laughs) to, yeah. Right. They can get their hands on it one way or another. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. not that hard to get competitor info. I mean, I, I have been at organizations where that was the fear, you know, of the executive team that prevented us from doing it. And it just, it's kind of a moot point because as your competitor, if I really want to find your information, I'm going to ask my husband to sign up for it or use my personal email address right. or even ask a client to go get the information. Like, and if you're in a company that is concerned about that, let me ask you, have you guys ever gotten your hands on competitor information? Because I'm guessing the answer is yes. <laughs> Guess what? They have your they have your stuff too. <laughs> right. Right. And I think, Deanna, to your point, it's there's other ways to still leave open that opportunity for someone to raise their hand. You're not preventing them from getting in touch with you at all. You're not like deterring somebody from contacting you. If they really want to talk to your sales team, you can always give that option, but don't gate a piece of content that could potentially get them further down the process and get them 
to the point where they're ready to talk. The option is always there for them to reach out directly or, you know, raise their hand and look for that contact. So one thing that we run into in all the companies that we talk to from time to time is an organization will say, my priority isn't building out more content. We're going to focus over here. What, what advice would you give to a company who is about to make that decision not to invest in their digital footprint or doesn't recognize how critical that's going to be moving forward as people continue to engage less and less with a salesperson as they're doing their research to make purchases? I would say take a look at how much you spend on your salesperson's salary, right? Your best salesperson, what do you spend on that salary? And then look at what you could take, what you could invest in for that same amount of money online and how many more people you could reach and how big your reach is and how you can really, you know, I mean, it's just so much more efficient to use that money and to invest in, you know, this huge thing. And then your salesperson who is, you know, your best salesperson or whatever, they're going to be making more sales in the long run anyway, because the people that come to them are going to be, you know, ready to buy. So I think that you have to look at it from the big picture and not just, you know, oh, I'm throwing money here and there. It's like, no, this is the same way you would invest in your sales team. You're investing in your digital sales team. Oh my God, that that is brilliant. I love it. I guess on the flip side is some of the things that have that helps us have that conversation with clients is really to sit down and look at how can we look at what they have currently, kind of audit and take into account all of the things that they have contributing to that digital footprint now and start to identify where are the gaps. And we can kind of use that as a way to help them understand and educate them on where those gaps are and where we feel like people are going to kind of fall off that process without without making that investment. I, you know, the reality is this isn't an overnight. I just built out all my content. We're going to have all these leads coming in the door. It's a long-term strategy. It takes time to mm-hmm. build out a demand gen engine. It takes time to get content out there. And then you've got to constantly feed that engine to stay relevant, to continue to build that footprint bigger and bigger and bigger. But I promise you over time, if done well, it will be a catalyst to growth because people are finding you out there online and they're loving the content that they're reading. And, you know, the right kind of prospects are actually raising their hand and saying, I want to buy from you because they were able to find all of this information online and they didn't have to sit through sales meetings. You know, they probably made their mind up before they ever reached out to you. And who doesn't want those kind of leads? So I think the takeaway here today is that you need to have a good digital presence. You need to create content for all three levels of the funnel. Let people, you know, take the journey themselves. Let people have it for free. Keep keep it current, you know, make sure that you're constantly feeding your content with new stuff. And um, if you're not online, you're missing out. Thanks for joining us on the Demand Gen Fix, a podcast for HR tech marketers brought to you by Growth Mode Marketing. We sure hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe for more perspectives on demand generation and B2B marketing strategies. Plus, give us a like. Tell your friends. We'll see you next time.